uh, welcome everyone who's already here in the room today with Ginger Smoke um, here at Go Learn, the University of Utah's travel program, the faculty-led travel program. And usually we have someone like Ginger taking us on a trip. Um, but as you all know, I keep repeating this, and many of you are, are groupies by now. So, um, but for those who are new, we're obviously not traveling, but we try to bring the road to you, try to bring some trivia and knowledge, and most importantly, one of our faculty members to you into your living room um, on a Thursday at noon. Some of uh, our future um, presentations will vary a little bit. So if you are here more often than once uh, and would like to join for the upcoming um, um, lectures, uh, please uh, look at the uh, registration dates and times because Thursday is a, a busy day for some of our faculty um, and those who are teaching but still want to join us here at Go Learn, they will do it either on a Friday or we will have one on Mondays. So keep an eye on that. But today at traditional hour and time, Ginger Smoke, uh, PhD in medieval history uh, from the University of Colorado, uh, uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder. And uh, shout out to our colleagues there. And uh, I would like to welcome everyone who has a degree from the University of Utah, as this is also brought to you by the Alumni Association. And today with a pro uh, professor from the Honors College. Welcome, Ginger. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christoph. Tell us a little bit, what is the Honor College? Uh, I have been uh, really privileged for the last six years to teach in the Honors College, which is a, uh, a really wonderful opportunity for students. Um, it is uh, high impact learning. Um, we value uh, uh, community um, based learning as well. Uh, students will live together, they take classes together, they do extracurricular activities together. Um, so it's, it's a really wonderful opportunity uh, to look into. Um, of course, now we're uh, on Zoom mostly, but we are also uh, continuing to do a lot of, of um, Zoom activities together, uh, students and the faculty. As well. so in, a normal, in a normal year, you have all your students in a wonderful building here on campus at the University of Utah. We and do. We're in the uh, Marriott Honors College, but we actually also will have one wing in the new Callert uh, dorm as well. Um, so they're in one wing now, and then there will be some offices as well of uh, faculty. So um, for those who are new to this, I will disappear. We have the pleasure to hear about the Black Death, uh, the 14th century. In fact, I think the uh, largest epidemic uh, ever recorded in human history. So uh, um, a morbid subject, but I hope we will learn a lot. Um, but um, um, again, I, would, I, I will leave the room, but we will have questions and answers at the end of this. So if you run your cursor over your screen, you'll see a Q&A and a chat function below. We'll get to your questions if you like um, in about 50 minutes or so from now and we will go through them chronologically um, and so please uh, let us know where you maybe come from if somebody comes from very far away we have people from texas who join us always and um, we even had someone from from europe the other day so thank you very much ginger um, i will disappear but i will stay in the background and i will i really look forward to this thank you for joining us today Thank you very much, Christoph, and, and thank you so much for asking me to do this. I'm, I'm always really um, quite excited to talk about, well, anything medieval, um, but especially the Black Death. And um, I will say, uh, you know, a couple of things first, and that is, um, uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, I will preface this by saying that I am not a scientist. Uh, I am a medieval historian of uh, midwifery and childbirth. I also do a little bit of anatomy. Um, so I do study medicine, but I am not an epidemiologist. And so I am looking through a uh, historical lens, of course, instead of a scientific one. So uh, that's the first thing I wanna say. 
And the second thing I'd like to say in um, sort of up front is that, you know, I, I thought about this topic when Christoph asked me because in the last six months, I've been asked so many times about uh, the connections between the medieval Black Death pandemic and the, co the current COVID pandemic. And so this is an opportunity to sort of think about uh, some similarities and what we might be able to learn from the Black Death of the 14th century and beyond and apply to our current situation. And then uh, the third thing that I might say, uh oh, hold on. Uh, hold on one second. For some reason, I am unable to advance my slide. Okay, hold on. There we go. Um, I'm a medievalist. Technology is not my strong suit. There we go. All right, and the third thing I'd like to say quickly is that the title, Bring Out Your Dead, of course, comes from the Monty Python, uh, the scene in Monty Python's Holy Grail. And uh, so, you know, a 45-year-old movie uh, now. Um, and when I first started teaching medieval history many, many moons ago, uh, I could start the scene, start reciting the dialogue from the scene, and all of my students would know and be able to recite with me. Um, bring out your dad, bring out your dad. I'm not dead yet. You will be. I'm feeling better, right? So, but I will say that um, increasingly, sadly, fewer and fewer of my students know the reference. Um, but okay, so let's talk first of all about the word pandemic. Uh, pandemic, of course, pandemos, uh, so pan meaning all, demos meaning people. And what that means, of course, is that it's worldwide. It happens in uh, a, a wide um, swath of different areas uh, at roughly the same time. And of course, if we think about the word plague, we can also take a look at where that comes from. And uh, the word itself seems to be coined by Galen, who was a physician in the second century, a uh, Roman physician. And it, it generally just means uh, something infectious. So he recognized that, uh, that this was an illness that was being, um, uh, spread. It was being transmitted. And so since we're talking about plagues, we can think back and look at several different plagues prior to the Black Death pandemic. Um, and uh, most of these are, as far as we can tell from the historical sources, most of these are bubonic in nature, and I'll talk more about that. Um, and then we also have the Black Death, which has bubonic and other forms. So, uh, for example, the Athenian plague, 5th century BCE, is a plague that was documented by Thucydides. Uh, it um, was one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, causes of the, uh, uh, of the, the, uh, end of the Second Peloponnesian War uh, because the Athen Athenians had to sue for peace. They couldn't keep fighting with all of these uh, people dying everywhere inside the walls of Athens. We also have the Antonine Plague uh, during the Antonine Dynasty of the Roman Emperors in the second century CE. And uh, that is uh, another probably bubonic plague that is um, uh, that shows up a lot in the historical sources. So we have a couple of these sort of smaller plagues, but then we have in the sixth century CE, we have the first plague pandemic. So this is sometimes called the Justinian plague. Uh, during the reign of Justinian the Great, uh, 
who was a Byzantine emperor who also uh, took Rome and the West, and that was 6th century CE. And so we call that the first plague pandemic, and we call the Black Death pandemic in the 14th century the second plague pandemic. Um, and so while the others were more localized, uh, these affected many, many different areas, East and West. So one of the things that we can think about when we talk about the Black Death in the 14th century especially, is how that this was an event that uh, uh, didn't happen in a vacuum, right? So this is something that happened in conjunction with several other really traumatic events. And so this is, uh, this is occurring in the late Middle Ages. And the late Middle Ages is sometimes called um, an era of chaos and calamity. And in fact, the 14th century in particular is often referred to as the calamitous 14th century. So uh, we can take a look at how medieval people conceptualized what was happening for uh, over a century. Um, and they saw this as the, the beginning of the end. So Four Horses of the Apocalypse. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with this uh, model, right, or this idea that we have uh, these four horses representing four distinct calamities, war, famine, pestilence, and death. And so in the 14th and 15th centuries, we see uh, the Hundred Years' War, for example, between England and France. Uh, we have also then famine. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But a widespread Northwest European famine that lasts for about seven years. Um, so 1315 to 1322. The third horse of the apocalypse then is pestilence. That is to say disease. So the black death. Um, and of course we are talking primarily about this initial uh, pandemic, 1347 to 1351, but it was an epidemic disease. And so for hundreds of years uh, afterwards, it continued to come back on relatively regular occasions and intervals. And then of course, the fourth horse uh, is death, which is relatively self-explanatory. And so we have multiple representations in art, for example, of these, uh, of these terrible events that are happening in the late Middle Ages and the four horses of the apocalypse in particular. So this is uh, Jan Bruegel the Younger, the triumph of death. And you can see uh, death depicted as a skeleton riding a skeletal horse um, with his uh, uh, sickle or scythe, I don't know, uh, and just mowing people down and his legion, his army of skeletons doing the same. Uh, if you look at other depictions of the Black Death in art, uh, in medieval art in particular, this one is a woodcut that is contemporary to the Black Death in England uh, in the 14th century, and you can see uh, London in the back and uh, the skeleton uh, standing astride some coffins there. Um, and uh, over, um, of course, in the, the bottom left, you can see a woman and her child who are covered with buboes with the um, uh, uh, signs of the bubonic death. And then over on the bottom right, you can see um, upper class nobles uh, trying to leave the city. Lord have mercy on London. Uh, I follow, we fly, keep out, we die. Okay, 
So let's talk about some of these things that are happening just prior to the Black Death uh, showing up in Europe. And think about how these uh, particular events or particular conditions might have exacerbated the disease, made it much, much worse. Um, one of the things that we talked a little bit about with the four horses was famine. And so one of the things that people sometimes ask me about is the uh, climate change. So we're familiar with climate change, uh, certainly uh, today, right? We have large swaths of the West, for example, on fire. Uh, if we look at what's happening in Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries, you can see that first of all, the climate got better uh, for a little while and the growing season was lengthened. Uh, it meant that um, more land could actually be cleared, forest land, marshes could be drained, uh, and a lot more land was brought under cultivation, which also meant that they could support a larger population. And truthfully, the population did increase, and it were estimating that the population actually tripled in this time period between the 12th and 13th centuries. So in the 14th century, at the beginning of the late Middle Ages, when the climate changed again and got progressively colder, starting about 1302 is the first time we hear in the sources about this process of getting colder, of Europe getting colder, leading to something called the Little Ice Age. Um, this, of course, meant that the, uh, they couldn't, uh, the, the growing season was shorter. Uh, they couldn't support the population uh, any longer. And it meant that there was a massive famine, especially in Northern Europe, uh, between 1315 and 1322, as I mentioned before. And that led to large scale star starvation. Um, people were literally starving to death in many cases. And so the question then becomes, did that famine and the malnourishment caused by people not getting enough to eat, did that cause, uh, did that predispose the population of Europe to getting sick, to the disease? And uh, historians have debated that for a long time, but truthfully, um, uh, bioarchaeologists, people who study the skeletons of those who died during the plague and during the 14th century, late Middle Ages especially, have noticed that the plague skeletons uh, also show signs of a malnourished population and that the so-called um, uh, frail, the, the medically frail, uh, died more often than others. So it does seem to have done that. So one of the questions that we also have is how many people died in the Black Death and particularly in this initial pandemic between 1347 and 51. And of course we have no real way of knowing that. Um, the answer is a lot, right? But we really are giving it our best guess. We're estimating using um, the sources that we do have. So you can sort of see here, uh, if we're looking at the Black Death in comparison to other plagues and other diseases, more or less, um, we can see that it killed um, millions of people, probably hundreds of millions of people. Here it says 200 million people. Again, that's a shot in the dark. But if you look at it compared to say, the plague of Justinian, 30 to 50 million, the first pandemic, right? Or for that matter, the flu of 1918, 1919, 40 to 50 million. Um, we're still talking about a huge number of people who died in the Black Death. Um, pandemic. So if we're thinking then about where this pandemic comes from, where this uh, disease comes from, 
one of the things we know is that uh, the same symptoms occur among the populations of Mongolia and China, okay? And so I'll come back to that, of course, some um, parallels with COVID that are begging to be made there. Um, but uh, they're coming uh, into the West through trade, through uh, shipping trade, naval trade, right? And reaches the port cities, uh, particularly in Sicily first, and then in Southern Italy shortly thereafter by about 1347. And so uh, moves inland pretty quickly. I'll show you a map here in a second. Uh, so in about three years, it has reached all the way up to the top of Scandinavia. And as I said before, we have a continued appearances, epidemic uh, incidences of this disease for the following 300 years or so. So the question then is, uh, again, um, can we look at this mortality rate and try to figure out numbers? And again, maybe not, but we can with pretty good um, confidence say that this first pandemic of the Black, or the Black Death uh, kills about one third to maybe even one half of Europe's population. Um, in some areas, we have a higher mortality rate than others. For example, England. England has a higher mortality rate than the continent. And I can talk a little bit about more about that in a little while. But um, by 1450 then, after several of these epidemics, and then also other things, including the, Black, uh, the um, Hundred Years' War, that's, that doesn't uh, conclude until 1453, more than half of Europe's population had been lost. And I might remind you uh, that the population tripled during the 12th and 13th centuries. So now we have this Malthusian effect um, of the population outstripping the resources and being cut back drastically. So I mentioned that this disease initially split, spreads along trade routes. And so we can see a couple of, of things here. Let me come to this map. I'll come back to that, in a, that slide in a second. This map shows you um, the, uh, inter, how that the Black Death entered the uh, Western Europe from the East through the Black Sea. Um, and of course, these are, these are just relative to random dates they're choosing, June 30th, 1347, which just means by mid-year of 1347, we see it coming into the Aegean and then into the Mediterranean. And by the end of that year, we can see it uh, affecting these port cities, right? So uh, Sicily and then um, also into up uh, Italy and into France as well. And then you can see very, very quickly, it's spreading out like, uh, sort of like dropping a pebble into a pond, right? And think about how quickly really that is to spread so far in only a short period of time. And one of the things that I tell my students when I'm talking to them about the how quickly everything was happening and the mortality rate, right? If it's one third and they're sitting in a big lecture hall, I tell them, well, look to the left of you and look to the right of you. And in a couple of weeks, one of those people won't be here anymore. And if they're both here, it's you, right? You won't be here. So of course, that always has a little bit of, a, of a, an effect on them as they start looking around and thinking about how quickly um, people can, uh, can, this disease can spread and how quickly people can die. So spreading along the trade routes, uh, by July of, 13, of um, uh, 1377, for example, so a subsequent uh, epidemic, couple of epidemics pass, um, we can see the beginnings 
of the uh, attempt to try to stave off this um, spread in these trade routes, these port cities in particular. And so the city of Ragusa, for example, in um, Croatia, uh, implemented something that is um, uh, very familiar to us right now. And so they initially implemented a 30-day isolation on, uh, that was imposed on arriving ships before being allowed to dock. So one of the things that's happening is that when the cargo is offloaded, of course, with the cargo are a bunch of rats. And we'll come back to the rat here in a minute, but, um, and also the sailors who are sick. So this 30 day requirement was extended in some places like Venice, for example, to 40 days. Um, shortly thereafter. And that, of course, is called a quarantino in Italian. And so that's the quarantine that we're so familiar with. And we can see these plague stricken towns and areas um, then, which also tried to implement a quarantine. So let's think about the um, actual uh, sort of cause of the plague and uh, think about how it is different than say COVID. Um, COVID is a virus. Uh, the Black Death was caused by a bacterium and this is called Yersinia pestis. Uh, and Yersinia pestis was uh, first identified as the cause back in uh, the 19th century but people weren't 100% sure about it, but, um, but pretty sure that that's what it was. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things then about the Black Death is that it does have different manifestations, different um, uh, methods of transmission <clears throat> and different um, ways that it manifests in the body. It's all caused by the same bacterium though, the same, um, Yersinia pestis, it just depends on how it enters the body. So Michelle Ziegler, who is a plague historian, um, notes that we can look at, for example, the bubonic form and the septicemic form of the Black Death uh, being transmitted by insect bites. And so we'll talk more about that in a minute, flea bites, let's say. Um, or uh, an abrasion or a cut, something like that. And then we also have another form, and this is the pneumonic form. And that is, of course, spread by inhalation of droplets, uh, sneezing and coughing. Um, and so this is something that we're very familiar with, with the coronavirus, uh, the spread through aerosol droplets. So on the left, we can see a picture of Yersinia pestis, um, a very uh, sort of nondescript broad shaped bacterium. And then on the right, we have the actually frankly beautiful um, vi coronavirus uh, that we're so familiar with right now. So a little bit more about bubonic, pneumonic and septicemic. Bubonic, of course, is what we think of today quite often when we think of Black Death, and that's because we still have a lot of bub not a lot, but we do have um, some bubonic plague uh, here in the United States, but also in other places, uh, especially in, uh, let's say, um, India has, uh, uh, still has epidemics, right? So the characteristic bubos that we're familiar with, um, that's where we get the word bubonic. This type of, this manifestation of the disease affects the lymphatic system. So if we think about these swellings, uh, anywhere we have lymph nodes, the neck, the armpits, the groin, these lymph nodes then get to be the size of, according to our uh, sources, uh, a softball a grapefruit, so really quite large. And this is a hemorrhagic disease. So 
what happens is that it's bleeding under the skin, right? So like Ebola or like other hemorrhagic diseases, it's um, uh, turning black from the blood underneath. And of course, these buboes will often have, uh, be very dark in the middle and will spread out and have a kind of rosy ring, a red ring around the bubo, which of course ring around the rosy, we'll talk more about too. Um, I might mention also that um, sometimes their uh, people, the affected fingertips or other extremities will turn black. So black death um, in that regard too. This one only spreads from the insect, usually a flea, but not always, talk more about that, to the host. So it cannot be spread person to person. It has a about a two to three week incubation period. It only has about a 60% mortality rate. When I say that, my students chuckle only, but comparatively, that's relatively low. So that meant that people could survive this form, right? They could have the bubonic illness and survive. And what that meant was that they were immune from future epidemics. Um, the jury's still out about uh, coronavirus. If we have COVID, are we immune? We just don't know. But here in this case, that does seem to be the case, okay? And so uh, it meant that in future epidemics, the people who were going to die were going to be those who had no immunity. And that generally will be uh, vulnerable populations of children who were born in the time since the last epidemic. So the second form, pneumonic respiratory system uh, involved here, coughing and sneezing, as I said before, spreads person to person. This one is can take whole villages out, whole cities are affected, Whole families will be wiped out by the pneumonic form of the illness. Three to five day incubation very quickly. Um, you can die very fast with the pneumonic and it has about a 90% mortality rate. So this is um, very high uh, comparatively, right? And then we also have the septicemic which means that it goes right to the circulatory system. It affects, you don't generally have the other, you don't have the buboes, you may have some coughing and sneezing, but generally you, uh, uh, this one will kill you very, very fast, 12 hours or less. Um, it will uh, affect your uh, circulatory system and you start to hemorrhage from all of your mucous membranes. Um, and this one does seem to have about 100% mortality rate. Uh, so if you get this one, you really have very, you have no chance of, of survival. So I mentioned epidemiologists, bioarchaeologists, paleopathologists. We all work together. Historians work with these scientists to try to understand the Black Death pandemic a little bit better, geneticists especially too. So in the last 10 years or so, there has been a lot of work done, um, an amazing amount of work actually done on the Black Death. And so we have Michelle Ziegler, who I already talked about, Monica Green, and other plague historians who've done a lot of historical work added to the scientific work, work as well. One of the things that um, started this uh, renewed um, investigation in the last 10 years or so is that in 2011, the um, uh, Yersinia pestis uh, bacterium was confirmed as the cause of the Black Death, uh, the pathogen, right, causing the Black Death. And they were able to sequence the entire genome and by doing that, researchers were able to determine that this is the same exact organism that has been causing the, the Black Death for the past 700 years. Uh, it has not really evolved. This is the same one. So transmission, I mentioned the poor little rats. The rats give, get a bad rap here. Um, I mean, look at that face, right? 
<laughs> All right. So uh, most historical work has been focused on the bubonic plague and especially the rat flea mode of transmission. So um, I'll, I'll show you a, a diagram here in a second of how that works, but uh, rats, the ratus ratus, the medieval brown rat has always been sort of seen as the, the villain here. Uh, but they're not the only carriers of the plague. And in fact, they're not even really the most efficient ones um, as far as the evolutionary um, survival, right, of the organism. There have been several hundred other species that have been identified. Um, and not just the fleas either. Um, humans are also passing the uh, body lice, the disease through body lice, which is kind of, it has a high ick factor, of course, but we have, uh, as human beings, lice on our bodies all the time. And that also uh, can then be a vector. We are the vector, in fact, in that case, in the bubonic plague, as well as the pneumonic. So you can see the cycles here. What happens is that the flea uh, has the Yersinia pestis, uh, bacterium in its gut. And the bacteria multiplies in the gut. And what actually happens is that the flea starts to starve to death because its gut is gorged. It's engorged with these, <clears throat> with the bacteria. And when they bite uh, a host and they drink the blood, they're actually not getting very much blood because of that. So they keep biting, right? And so keep spreading. So um, uh, if they're biting us, then we get the disease. If they're biting another host, a, a rat or another um, mammal in particular, then that can act as a vector uh, by, of course, spreading it from place to place, especially with cargo or in very crowded cities. And as I mentioned, we also have um, uh, humans that can act as vectors for both bubonic and pneumonic. So what did medieval people believe caused the Black Death? Well, they have several different, uh, different sort of things that they're looking at, possible causes, theories, one of which is the miasma uh, theory. And so miasma is sometimes translated or defined as corrupt air. Um, corrupt, bad, stinky air, polluted air, so pollution, right? Um, and this comes from the report of the Paris Medical Factor Faculty in October of 1348. This corrupted air necessarily penetrates to the heart and corrupts the substance of spirit there. So what happens is you breathe that miasma in and it goes to your heart and it causes you, your, your spirit, your, your essence uh, to also be corrupted. So where does this bad air come from? It uh, can come from fissures in the earth. Uh, so earthquakes can open up rock in the earth bedrock. And that sounds familiar too, since we just had an earthquake here in Utah, of course, a large earthquake in uh, about the same time, right, that we started to have um, the spread of our own pandemic. Uh, other bad sources of bad smells, bad air could come from uh, dead bodies. So the smell of decomposition, for example, the ordinances of Pistoia in Tuscany said no one is allowed to carry a dead plague body outside the house until the coffin has been, quote, nailed down so that no stench can escape. So there is a sense of, um, you know, being careful about uh, how you handle bodies or being around dead bodies and especially plague bodies, which actually makes some sense, right? And you can also think about that if you're looking at the rats because uh, where, you know, where, where are rats? Well, they're sometimes in um, dumps, garbage dumps or sewers where uh, we actually can have a lot of, of illness. Um, so they're not completely far off there. 
Other uh, ordinances in these cities said that certain occupations couldn't practice in the city anymore. Tanners couldn't tan their skins within the city. Butchers can't dump their entrails and blood um, because it would pollute the air. And then they also believed that miasma could enter through the pores of the body. So bathhouses were closed and people were told that they should use fire to purify the air. Um, so several sources talk about that. Other causes, planetary alignment in the heavens. Um, so this idea that um, if uh, uh, planets are aligned in a particular way, it can cause the air to be corrupt. Or God's wrath, uh, greed, sin, and corruption causes God to be angry, and God is then punishing the population. So manifest, manifestation of God's vengeance. And then we have something uh, that I called the death ray. Um, they didn't call it the death ray. I call it the death ray. But uh, that is to say that uh, if you were um, a well person and you looked at the eyes of a sick person, then um, the nature, the, the, there's sort of a beam, right? A ray of illness that will enter into your eyes um, and cause you to get sick. So depending on the type of uh, manifestation, the type of illness you have, fever, buboes, right? And other blackness, black splotches on your skin. Um, stench, that's one of the symptoms that uh, we see over and over that it just smells really bad. You smell terrible. Bleeding, I said it's a hemorrhagic disease. Bleeding from your eyes, from your mouth, your nose. Coughing, sneezing, right? So what are some of the uh, ways that they tried to treat the illness? Well, Plague doctors did make uh, their rounds. They did come in and barber surgeons as well tried to do certain things, including, for example, lancing the buboes. Um, they would use leeches and other forms of venous section or of bleeding, right, to, uh, to treat the illness as a, uh, in the Hippocratic corpus, we see the humoral theory of illness. So everyone has these four humors in their bodies, uh, which are sort of like fluids and um, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And if you have too much of something, so in this case, you have too much blood, right? Because there's blood pooling under the skin, um, you have to then uh, uh, bleed that person. So blood should be taken from the vein. Uh, and then, we also have apothecaries offering all manner of uh, herbal concoctions. And the one, the one we see over and over is called theriac, which is, we just really don't know all manner of, uh, of herbs and other ingredients that go into these things. We don't know exactly what it's made up of. But that along with laxatives and purgatives and other kinds of uh, ways of getting the sick out of you uh, were prescribed by doctors. And so uh, one of the things that we also hear being prescribed a lot is for the person to smell something good, which if you think about that, that has a sort of a prophylactic effect. So if we're talking about miasma being bad smelling air or corrupted air, once you smell something bad sort of in the air, you want to then quickly counteract that with something good smelling. So people would carry around flower petals or um, uh, incense or some other kind of good smelling thing, wear a vial of rose water around their necks and that way. Uh, they could sort of counteract the effects of the miasma and not get sick. And so some of you probably, many of you probably have seen this image. This is actually an image from the 17th century, so a little bit later. But uh, you can see that this plague doctor is wearing uh, 
um, a, a, a cloak of oiled cloth um, to keep the illness from passing through his clothing, uh, and, and also these yellow gloves, which were also oiled cloth. You also see him wearing a mask, and this is a uh, very emblematic symbol of the Black Death, right? A bird mask. Uh, and if you look at the mask, one thing to notice is that it has um, crystals covering the eyes, and that is for the death rays to protect the eyes from getting this direct onslaught of the illness. Um, and then the beak actually serves as a receptacle to keep good smelling stuff in, right? So you can put some flower petals, um, you can put some other uh, uh, camphor or, or musk oil or something else, right? And that'll keep you from smelling the miasma. So, uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, right? That makes sense um, as well. I might also mention that uh, we say ashes, ashes. That also could be achus, achus, uh, which could refer to the pneumatic form of the disease. And then we all fall down as relatively self-explanatory. So here are some pandemic masks. Uh, on the left is an authentic bird mask, right? So you can see that that depiction come to life. And then on the right, um, an authentic COVID mask. So, all right, so bring out your dead. How were the dead dealt with? How were they um, buried and treated? Well, of course, many of us who have seen that, that iconic scene in um, uh, Monty Python, or other depictions, we know about these pits, right? These pit burials. Uh, and that's what we think most happened most often, that they were just overwhelmed and inundated. And sometimes that is true. There are some cases when uh, cities could not or villages could not handle the volume of dead and pits were used, but really those were a last resort. And we do have plague funerals being described over and over and over in our chronicles and other treatises. Um, we do have the family, uh, you know, uh, accompanying the body to the cemetery and um, for the burial. One of the things though we do see is that the, many of these uh, municipal ordinances did limit, they, they said that you, the families had to actually hire somebody to carry those plague bodies to the cemetery. They couldn't do it themselves. So to limit the exposure, uh, you know, to just a few people if they could. Um, and other things too, uh, the outlawing of drummers or other musicians, the churches couldn't ring the bells because as one ordinance says, um, it, the bells would be ringing 24 hours a day and people would uh, become anxious and depressed. And so uh, no, none of those sort of trappings. But if you look at a couple of the artistic depictions, this one is burying plague victims at Ternai in 1349, you can see that they're making coffins. Um, and uh, while everything looks a little jumbled here, it was quite orderly in that regard. They are actually burying most plague victims in coffins, in cemeteries, uh, in individual graves. This is a photo uh, from London in the 1980s. They were uh, excavating a piece of land at the Old Royal Mint and uncovered this 14th century uh, plague cemetery. And you can see how orderly uh, the graves look, right? And of course, this is one of the reasons why we have so much um, of the uh, bioarchaeology work going on because we have a lot of plague 
bodies uh, to, to look at, uh, bones and teeth. Uh, the, the illness is recorded in the teeth uh, primarily too. So what are the consequences to a society? Well, certainly religious consequences, social, socioeconomic consequences, and then other consequences that we can look at in our own society to uh, today. So if then this is a punishment from God, what do we do? Well, there were different reactions. So some people sought isolation. Some people, and in fact, um, uh, Giovanni, Giovanni Boccaccio, who wrote the Decameron, um, a, uh, a, an Italian um, humanist writer in the 15th century, he talks about how people would, if they could, they would find a comfortable um, room in their house. Uh, they would then lock the door and they would isolate themselves as long as they could. So social distancing and, and physical distancing as well. So some people did take that route and other and, and, and took on this sort of time of penance or penitence and, and thought about what they were doing wrong and, and what society was doing wrong and tried to make, uh, make to atone for those sins. Others sort of took a different approach. Uh, of course, the let's eat, drink and be merry approach to life and death. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I'm not going to worry about it. I might be dead tomorrow. I'm going to go do whatever I want. But the religious reactions, especially the penitential reactions, um, you can see in a couple of different ways. Some of you might be familiar with, for example, the flagellants. The flagellants were those um, who would try to appease the wrath of God by parading through town, whipping each other with a flagella right, flagellant, flagella is a whip, um, to take on the sins of those people in that town. Um, clergy had a very high mortality rate, as you might imagine. Um, so in some parishes in England, for example, two thirds of the priests died and that was primarily giving last rites. And of course then, you that's, that's a lot of people. You couldn't necessarily replace them with very, very, um, uh, experienced or knowledgeable clergy and so often replaced with very um, with less knowledgeable clergy and of course for those of you who know about Martin Luther and other reformers this was something that they really worried about clerical ignorance and then of course this search for scapegoats and um, attacks primarily on marginalized people and especially on Jewish communities. And uh, this is a procession of the flagellants, by the way. So you can sort of see them um, walking through town in this line so they can um, whip each other. Uh, the, the reason why Jews were often uh, accused of causing this plague or spreading this plague willingly actually um, consciously spreading this, this plague was that they were often partially or in some cases completely immune to the disease. And so they kept kosher, so kept the um, garbage dumps outside of the cities. They also often lived in ghettos, so they were isolated anyway. Um, they uh, were blamed for doing things like poisoning the wells in Christian cities. Um, and so we do see these trials, these criminal trials where they're put on trial for these crimes and then also, and executed, and also pogroms which occurred throughout, especially Germany, um, Poland, also some in um, East France. And so we have references in some of these uh, chronicles. Uh, Jean de Venette in France talks about this, so this uh, medieval holocaust, which actually has been present in certain areas of France and uh, Germany since the First Crusade at the end of the 11th century. Uh, so not new, but exacerbated by the Black Death. 
And so, you know, some, some sort of scapegoating, China virus. Okay, so we can certainly see similar things. I want to show you this again real quickly, and that is because I wanted to show you these lo the, the large green blob in the uh, east there, and then one over in uh, the Pyrenees, uh, smaller green blob. Those are the areas that were not, uh, the, where people didn't get a sick or sick at all, and those are Jewish ghettos. So uh, you can see where that fear comes from. So how can we connect all of this then to our own pandemic, our own situation with COVID? What are these effects of the Black Death pandemic? Well, I mentioned social distancing. So what are we told, right? We're told to wash our hands, wear a mask, um, and social distance. And so in the Black Death, they did social distance. I already mentioned one situation of, of sort of isolating or quarantining, but we also see that nobles and uh, the upper bourgeoisie left the, the, the cities when they could for the countryside to wait out the epidemics. And again, Boccaccio in his work, The Decameron describes that. Um, large numbers of men and women abandoning their cities and their homes, heading for the countryside. And the Decameron is actually a story about 10 young people leaving Florence and going out to the countryside to um, wait it out, wait out the epidemic. And they uh, pass the time by telling each other stories. So um, it's, uh, it's a very good sort of depiction of what the what you could do if you could if you could if you had the ability um the poor who could not leave did die dispar disproportionately right there more poor people did die but we do see deaths universally across each of these individual uh ranks and statuses and groups as well including three archbishops of canterbury and also Edward, King Edward III of England's daughter who died. So uh, no one was safe from this, um, from this disease ultimately, right? Uh, if we think about some of these other effects that we of course are very, very concerned with today with our own pandemic, one is the effects on the economy. Um, in the 14th century, one of the things that happened almost immediately was that we have this huge impact on the agrarian economy, uh, followed eventually by the manufacturing economy. Uh, so the sources talk about harvests, you know, the, the, the fields just being abandoned and crops rotting, um, and trade uh, non-existent uh, uh, and the price of grain fell very, very quickly and very, very uh, uh, precipitously. And wages, what that meant was that rage, wages rose for agricultural workers immediately, right, initially. Um, and this lasted for about a year and a half or in some places a little longer. And it, what it meant was that uh, agrarian workers could actually, the poor in particular, could actually really uh, rise uh, their material conditions of, of life, could get much, much improved and sometimes called the golden age of the poor. Um, but landlords eventually, you know, they recovered pretty quickly and they were able to reduce their labor costs and increase their profitability. And they did that in a couple of different ways that I'll talk about, including passing laws to try to limit the amount of wages that they had to pay. So, um, yes, the poor improved, the poor's life improved but not for very long. So the golden age is real, but it's relatively contracted, right? What about women? <sighs> women also had 
some improvements in their lives and in their conditions, their legal, uh, uh, their legal uh, status, right? Um, there were some benefits for women who survived. Um, so that is to say they could sometimes, some historians have argued that they could actually find employment in so-called male positions. They could migrate to towns to work in the textile industry eventually and make more money. Um, but ultimately, you know, other historians have pointed out, and this is really true, that that is sort of short-lived as well. And also it was mitigated by the fact that women were often prevented from seizing these opportunities uh, to work in these high, uh, you know, these, these jobs, temporary jobs that made a huge wage. Um, and so women tended not to get hired for those jobs as often. Uh, and they would take service, uh, longer term service position contracts, often in cities as a result, um, which paid less, right? So women tended to work in low skilled, low paid jobs. And that was as true in 1700 as it was in 1300. So yes, did their lives improve some? Yes, but not systemically, right? So on one hand, yes, some property rights uh, that they hadn't had before. So for example, in England, some parts of England, they could, uh, if their husbands died, they could then keep the land. Um, even if they uh, remarried, in some cases, they could keep that land. They could inherit that land, right? Um, and in some places, for example, in England, we actually do see laws that say that women could make the same wages as men for the same work. But as I said before, they weren't usually given the opportunity. They weren't hired for haymaking or harvesting um, unless there were no men to do the job at all. So of course, what that means is yes, there were some improvement just like with the poor, but ultimately didn't change systematically or systemically, right? Um, they were still relatively immobile. They still were sort of locked into these um, uh, lower skill, lower wage jobs, right? So they, they were less able than men to sustain those gains from the Black Death. Uh, I mentioned that there were regulations passed to try to limit these gains, um, particularly in England. We see the Ordinance and Statute of Laborers, so 1349, 1351. And what that meant was that not only were wages uh, being limited, but we also have this attempt to keep restricting uh, the the uh, the casual contract, right? So you have to, so every man under 60 has to join the workforce in the ordinance. Um, but they couldn't just move around, they had to stay in their same spot. And then the statute of laborers in 1351 said that vassals, so feudal vassals, and particularly serfs and other um, people at the lower end, who had these obligations, these labor obligations to feudal lords, they had to keep offering their lords their work before they could work for somebody else for money. So this is an attempt to keep that feudal system intact. But one of the things that does ultimately happen, and this is a big change, and I'll talk more about that in one second, um, is that Really, the Black Death is the death knell, knell for feudalism, uh, which had been sort of on rocky ground for a while anyway, uh, because land was readily available. Um, the poor could occasionally just, you know, they could buy it. They could just cultivate it. Uh, they didn't need to work for others. Um, they could press for higher wages, and they could also press, if they were serfs, they could press for an elimination of those 
of that position, of those restrictions. Um, governments did react with these uh, ordinances. They tried to reimpose those, those rules and keep feudalism intact, right? But this led to rebellion. And of course, this is also something that we can look at this summer um, with our own pandemic. So we have resistance to the government implementing, trying to keep the systemic oppressions um, in place. Uh, so resistance to that, resistance to higher taxes that were uh, imposed because of the war going on. The war is still going on, the Hundred Years War, right? Uh, so the ongoing pandemic and perception of, of uh, and the war and, and corruption of the government as a lot of people saw and other kinds of, of uh, things that people really saw as unfair, inequitable, all of this pushes society to, um, to react, to revolt, to rebel. And of course, these rebellions were in, at least initially brutally suppressed. And this happens not just in one place, it happens all over Europe. It happens in France, early uh, Jacquerie. It happens in England in, thir in the 1380s with the English Peasants' Revolt. It happens in Florence, so uh, Boccaccio's uh, town, with the Champi Rebellion. Um, and in each case, these are peasants and also city workers who are rising up against this oppression, feudal oppression, uh, taxation, serfdom, um, right, and political corruption. So that should sound familiar to us a bit. And of course, that's one more way we can see these connections. This is the suppression, uh, the brutal suppression of the Jacquerie in 1358 in France. Um, the government sent out troops, right, to suppress that rebellion. And of course, um, in May of this year, we can see our own uh, rebellions and resistance to systemic oppression. So finally, how do we, what do we learn? <laughs> um, out of the calamitous 14th century, the, uh, all of the chaos of, and trauma of the late Middle Ages, the Hundred Years' War, the Black Death, the Great Schism, which was a split in the papacy, uh, where we actually had for a little while two popes and then three popes. So, you know, one pope says black, the second pope says white, the third pope says taupe, I don't know, right? So we have all of this, this, you know, who do we look to? Who has the answers? All of this calamity. And out of that, of course, comes the um, Renaissance and um, secularism and humanism and a fundamental reorganization of society. And of course, human beings are good at adjusting. Um, if we think about it, right, think about uh, you know, people ask me this all the time. Do you think every, things will ever be the same? And the answer is, you know, no, they won't. But uh, think about, you know, after 9-11, when everybody said things will never be the same. They're not the same. But, and we do look back fondly and say, remember when we could fly? We could go um, to the airport a half an hour before our flight, um, and we can't do that anymore. But we adjust and it becomes our new normal. And we find ways to reconceptualize and ways to change and ways to live our life, our lives, um, hopefully better than before. And so of course, that's the question. Will we be able to use our own, this pandemic, our own pandemic as an opportunity to break the cycle of systemic racism and sexism? Can we learn from the past? 
when they eliminated feudalism, can we do something similar here? Will we see a rebirth? Uh, will we see the birth of a new era? Right? And ultimately, I think that is what we learn from history. Thank you very much. Hey, Ginger. That was hey. awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Especially the, uh, the end, I have to say, um, for those, uh, most of us are, uh, are here. We have, you know, about 10 people left, but we have 130 people still in the room plus. So thank you. This is a, actually quite a great audience. Um, uh, we will get to our questions. I, I appreciate uh, a lot of things in, that you brought back, refreshed my memory on the little ice age. Um, which which sort of escaped me, but I, I knew about it, but I'm like, I didn't know the connect connectivity to uh, this particular pandemic we talked about. So that's really interesting. Uh, what I really found interesting was this 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 organism that you talked about, which causes the, the plague since since that time, 700 years and not changing, you know, it's right. and, it is, and it is existing uh, still, correct, right? True, that's correct. Um, that, that begs the question, are we sort of immune to it? Is it just because it's so confined? It's in such small numbers? Um, we are not immune. Um, the black, we do have black death epidemics, but in uh, a lot of places, in other areas, we have, it's endemic. Um, okay. Got it. And we can treat it with antibiotics now. It's relatively easy to treat. And Which is why we don't end up with these big, yeah. Yay, science. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get to these questions. I'll start with the uh, Q&As um, that we have many off. Um, so um, Donald is writing. Let me see if I can get this a little smaller so I can read it better. Uh, yeah, Donald is asking, I recently finished reading a book on the military history of the First Crusade, which captured Jer Jerusalem in 1099. Uh, the book mentions several well-known crusaders who died of the plague, you know, uh, during the crusade about 300 years earlier than the dates that you discuss. Do you know if those references to the plague uh, are the same as the Black Death? You know, that is, uh, that is the question, right? We don't know um, if it, it is entirely possible that that can be bubonic plague. Um, it's not an epidemic, or at least it's not a widespread plague at that time, but there were people who did get the, black, the, the bubonic plague in particular um, throughout the Middle Ages. So that's entirely possible. Uh, if I look, if I were able to look at the symptoms, I might be able to tell you better, <laughs> but it is possible. Yeah, no way to interview them, right? 1099, right? that's a while ago. If we had their bones. Yep, we find their bodies. So then yep. uh, um, let's get to the next one. Carol, uh, could you say uh, something about Am, the 17th century plague village in Derbyshire, England, and the village self-distancing? Good question. That is a really fascinating uh, case study, actually, very fascinating story. This uh, was a village who decide, that decided to um, quarantine themselves, to isolate the entire village. And they uh, walled themselves off and they wouldn't accept any trade uh, goods and nothing in, nothing out. And they waited it out until, they, uh, until everyone who was going to die did. And it, it took about a year. Um, and actually just, you know, Again, I'm not a scientist, so, uh, but I have heard something about the fact that, uh, that the descendants of those plague, those, those inhabitants of that city who had the illness but did not die, and then, you know, uh, now we have these descendants several hundred years later, those uh, people are immune to HIV and nobody knows why. Wow. Yeah. That was in 1665, 1666. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a bunch of years, so wow. That's a bunch of years. <laughs> um, cool, I, you know, things you learn, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, let's go to Frank's questions. Why were, why were there some cities like Munich unaffected? 
Uh, well, I mean, some cities, of course, have in the um, uh, the ghetto cities, right, who are isolated um, physically, uh, and Christians would not interact with the Jews in with trade or in other ways if they could avoid that. Um, other cities, just for whatever reason, they may not have been on a particular vector, right, right. during that particular um, uh, time. Uh, I, I can't necessarily speak to every city, but I can speak to those cities that were part of the ghettos. Yeah, some, uh, I saw your map that showed these red dots, which had this indicated the cities were not affected. Some of them are near to my heart, like Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I kind of know the trade routes. And on the other side of that map is another trade route that goes north of, of Nuremberg. And those cities were affected. So um, one never knows. Right. So maybe it's just also a little bit of luck. Luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, Frank, sorry. <laughs> Don't have all the answers. Uh, Tim, uh, knowing what you know about the plague, if you lived during that time, what would you have uh, done to protect yourself? Ooh, great question. Um, knowing what I know now, of course, I would have uh, isolated. I would have um, quarantined myself. I would have um, certainly um, kept away from uh, other people, who, you know, who were coughing and sneezing. Um, and I, of course, would have washed my hands great. and worn a mask. Okay. Um, we have more in the uh, Q&A, but I'm going to switch over to the chat room really quick. Um, uh, let's see, wonderful presentation. Uh, okay, um, just comments in that, so that's good. I'm again going back to the Q&A. What drew you to this field of study? Oh, I don't know, other than... Um, Medieval history has always sort of fascinated me. And I will tell you a real quick story. Um, I was, uh, I actually was a biology major for, for two years. And uh, I realized that that might not be my calling. Um, <laughs> and so I started taking history classes because I enjoyed them. And I took a couple of, of modern history and yeah, they were okay but I took a medieval class and I was in love. And uh, I think that was, it was really, it was the idea of human beings um, sort of existing in another sort of time, but, uh, but, but recognizing them and knowing sort of what they were thinking in many cases. And of course the medicine stuff, I started thinking about um, midwifery and childbirth uh, when I was uh, thinking about having my own children. Um, no offense STEM, but yay humanities, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, just a comment on the uh, scapegoat. Uh, I do not think that it is accurate to link the word scapegoat to China virus. The word scapegoat means that a person is blamed for or some problem or infraction, even if they are in, uh, innocent. In the case of well, COVID-19, there is there is no doubt whatever where it started and who was responsible. Um, in the case of COVID-19, there is no blame being placed on the innocent. So I, I guess. We got, we got the, we entered the political realm. <laughs> well, that and happens. of course, I'm, I'm just making a connection, right? Because um, uh, the Black Death, we do look at China, Chinese origins. Um, and uh, in this case, of course, if we're thinking about labeling this as the China virus, I'm just making a little point. All right. Uh, Okay, I think Frank just corrected himself. It wasn't Munich that was spared. It was just places like Milan, he says, or other, or Oberammergau. Um, um, what are the differences in cleanliness standards between then and now? Well, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> hopefully now we, um, we, we heed the, um, 
the advice to wash our hands frequently. Um, and of course, you know, we have a, a different sense, a, a, a different sensibility uh, about um, hygiene and cleanliness. Um, in the uh, in many of these cities, and especially in the West, in Christian cities, I mentioned that they kept their garbage dumps inside the walls, which you know uh, was was certainly one of the the ways that we could see this disease spreading, and of course other diseases, not just this one. Um, we have a better sense now. Of course, we've gone through many many. Uh, diseases since then, we have a, a, a better sense of how to sort of contain um, some of the, you know, to put our dumps away from the cities and, and other kinds of things and to be, be more worried about uh, sewage, wa clean water, mm -hmm. and other kinds of uh, hygiene practices. Yeah. Um, there, there are probably a, a whole host of, of differences between the, the Middle Ages and, and, and today, um, especially in regards to science and knowledge and, and phys physical um, hygiene. Um, I, we get a lot of, I don't want to read them all out, but there's been a lot of people who say this was fascinating, um, great research, you know, wonderful um, organized presentation. So Ginger, a lot of compliments um, on behalf of our audience to you. So. Thank I you. want to, yes, uh, <laughs> I would want to thank you very, very much for this presentation, um, a, uh, a topic that, um, you know, a, a, as we are going through a pandemic uh, is, is very apropos and very important to, to know that this is nothing new. I really liked your comments at the end. Um, will the world change, you know, in regards to travel, will we travel differently? Uh, we will. Will we travel better? I hope, you know, um, and um, maybe uh, um, as it was in the Middle Ages for sure, uh, maybe we have a new um, appreciation to life, to the arts, to, to things that we cannot do right now and want to do. And maybe we have a renaissance of sorts coming out of this as well, so. I certainly hope so. Thanks for the, for the good and hopeful spin and um, have a wonderful rest of the week and good luck with the semester and all your students stay healthy. And uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart for this. Thank you so much. And thank you all for your comments and your questions too. All right, thank you, bye. Bye.